hello and good evening everyone welcome to today's Bluehead's virtual seminar the 98th Bluehead's virtual seminar Bluehead's virtual seminar is a platform that allows healthcare professionals to discuss current management updates of different health related topics for better patient care and this platform is sponsored uh, today's platform is sponsored by Tankara Technologies for the Leonard project with Bluehead Ethiopia so LearnNAT is a comprehensive platform dedicated to offering valuable information on pregnancy, childbirth, and the initial stages of childhood development, catering to both parents and expectant mothers. Additionally, LearnNAT offers convenience of doctor consultations for individuals seeking professional advice. Moreover, LearnNAT features a marketplace that showcases a diverse range of maternity-related products providing a one-stop solution for the needs of expectant mothers. Lennart has entered into a collaborative partnership with Bloods Ethiopia with the primary objective of enhancing the expertise and knowledge of Lennart's medical professionals, particularly focusing on the intricate aspects of pregnancy. So this strategic alliance is geared towards providing specialized training and upskilling the opportunities for doctors associated with LearnNAT, ensuring they are well equipped with the latest insights and advancements in the field of obstetrics. So to say a few things about Blue Hills, Blue Hills Ethiopia is a medical consultancy company founded by medical doctors and a computer engineer, and we aim to be an influential healthcare leader in creating a skilled community through easily accessible knowledge and preventive medicine. And I'm your host, Dr. Iheno Tadela, a general physician and first aid trainer from Blue Hills, Ethiopia. Today, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Dawit Mesman here with us to have a presentation on normal pregnancy. Dr. Dawit Mesman has had previous uh, Blue Hills virtual seminars multiple of times. You might remember him from his previous uh, presentation on uh, danger signs of pregnancy and nutrition in pregnancy. Yeah, you can access his previous uh, webinars on our YouTube channel soon. So, for those of you who don't know Dr. Dawit, Dr. Dawit Masman is an obstetrician and gynecologist. He's also the assistant director of the obstetrics and gynecology department at Zoe 2 Memorial Hospital. Uh, doctor, you can begin. Okay, uh, thank you, Doc. Uh, um, so as he presented, uh, my name is Dr. Dawit, and I'm an obstetrician and gynecologist from Zauritu Memorial Hospital and the department head of the OBGYN. And uh, I'm so uh, delighted to uh, give you this session on normal labor and delivery process uh, for pregnant mother. And, uh, uh, we'll try to see briefly uh, on each aspect of the normal labor and process, starting from the beginning. Uh, and hopefully it's going to be uh, an interesting topic for all of you. And uh, uh, if you have any questions, finally, uh, just write me on the chat box and so that I can address them. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, to begin with the uh, topic of normal level and uh, delivery, First, uh, we need to be able to define what's labor and uh, delivery, okay? So, uh, this labor and delivery basically has been defined by different institutions in different manner. And uh, the one you see on the, on, the, on the screen is the definition on the standard textbook and uh, by our Ministry of Health guideline. So, basically, we say labor a pregnant mother's labor, uh, which is a process where regularly trying contractions that could possibly result in progressive uh, dilatation and effacement. And finally, uh, the overall results will end up in delivery of the fetus, a placenta and a membrane. Okay, so uh, here there are three concepts that you all have to emphasize. Whenever we say a labor, uh, there has to be a contraction. Okay, we do. We may, uh, pregnant women could have a signs of contraction starting from the 16 weeks of her pregnancy, but these contractions, like the so-called the Braxton contraction and so on, they are irregular types, fine types of contractions. But through time, uh, uh, when she reaches to around nine months, around 37 to 42 weeks these contractions will start to be regularized, okay? So the contraction has to be regular, 
and that contraction has to be able to produce some kind of cervical change that is uh, dilatation and effacement okay and finally this process will should end up in delivery of uh, healthy fetus placenta and as well as uh, membrane so this is a definition uh, that we should all agree on okay and according to the who it has to, the definition comprises of some changes in spontaneous it has to be spontaneous in onset and it has to be low risk okay starting from the beginning up to the end of delivery okay so and it has to be occur during the time range of set 7 to 42 weeks of uh, gestational age and both the mother and the infant has to end up in a good condition okay so this is a definition that is actually given by the who so uh the next is something that we need to know whenever we see no we say normal labor uh, it means that there is something which is called abnormal labor so in order to differentiate between these two uh, normal and abnormal labor there are certain criteria that the normal labor has to fulfill okay the first thing is it has there should be no complications associated okay whenever we say complications associated like preeclampsia previous scar multiple pregnancy and the likes okay if there are certain risks pregnant obstetric complications then we don't consider that one as a normal labor okay and it has to be spontaneous which means we don't need to augment we don't need to induce the labor it has to come uh, within a time range which is term which is at 7 to 42 weeks and it has to be by its own which is spontaneously okay and the other most important criteria to say a normal labor is it has to come with a vertex presentation okay which means the head has to come uh, at the initial point okay it shouldn't come with a hand or it shouldn't come with a breech or a buttock okay so it has to come in a cephalic and a vertex presentation the other most important thing is the delivery the delivery process has to be assisted but with a minimal level okay even if we don't do anything the delivery process could be completed without any assistance okay so uh it has to be with a minimal assistance as much as possible okay and the other is it has to be in a normal uh, duration of labor the first stage of labor the second stage of labor has to be completed within the uh, acceptable time range frame okay so if it's if that is so and uh, if finally we came up with a good outcome of the mother as well as the new unit, then we can consider it to be a uh, normal level okay so these are the most important criteria that we all need to uh, understand to say it is a normal level okay so that's the most important thing whenever we talk about normal level and delivery is the issue of partition Okay, the issue of partition normally uh, partition is a process of giving birth okay the process of giving birth and timing of birth is a major determinant of pregnant sex because as we all know if the baby deliver before the time of 37 weeks or before the woman gets that term level okay there are certain complications associated with delivery of preterm baby if the baby deliver after 42 weeks there are certain complications that we may anticipate by being a post term okay so timing is very important okay uh, for uh, or it's a major determinant for a pregnancy success okay and usually this process of giving birth is actually initial uh, it's, it requires the combination of this endocrine paracrine and autocrine signaling okay so these signalings are in between the fetus the uterus the placenta and the uh, mother okay so basically uh, whenever we see of evolutionary perspective uh, when we consider other the human with other animals okay the other animals usually they have a straight shot through the birth canal usually which means their birth canal is not as such a complicated one and usually the babies go strictly downward uh, without any difficulties okay uh, without without when i say without any difficulty means like without twisting turning or flexing or extending okay but in case of humans due to this awkward shape of the size of the bony pelvis of the females okay uh, the, the the baby has to undergo different cardinal movements in order to uh, get delivered okay so uh, this is the most important evolutionary aspect that we should see whenever we consider 
uh, or whenever we compare human with uh, other animals during the process of giving birth. Okay, so whenever we talk about this parturition, we have uh, uh, phases of parturition. Okay, so we have four phases of parturition. The first one is called the quiescence phase. Okay, so quiescence phase is uh, a phase where uh, before the initiation of parturition or before the set seven weeks of or before the initiation before the woman enter into term and we consider it to be the quiescence uh, phase of uh, parturition it means the pregnancy is maintained in this type okay there is no activity that results in the contractility of the uterus and result in uh, changing the cervix and delivery okay so in this stage Everything is in a smooth, uh, quiet time, okay, where the uterus smoothness are not affected and the baby is protected inside out, okay. Uh, the, the immune, even the immune system, will protect the baby because the baby, the baby is not be included, the baby is not uh, considered to be as a foreign body, the immune system will protect it, and also the cervix also will. Uh, protect the, uh, the, the the baby, the infant, because the, the cervix at the time of this period is going to be covered by a mucus plaque, which actually prevents the, uh, the entry of infection from external to the intrauterine cavity. So basically, during this quiescence phase, uh, it's a quiet phase, and there is no activity of the uterus. There is no activity of the uterus that could possibly result in the contractility as well as changing the cervix. Okay. And the second phase that you can see is a uh, activation phase. Okay. Basically, this activation phase is a labor initiation phase. Okay. Before the onset of labor, the, the, the uterus has to be a little bit prepared, as well as the cervix has to be a little bit prepared. So basically, the cervix will lose its functional ability. Okay. And also, the uterus also will lose its uh, quite necessary so that some changes will appear. For example, there will be functional loss of pregnancy maintenance. There will be synthesis of factors that actually induce this parturition process. And uh, maturity by itself, at the time of 37 weeks to 42 weeks, the baby will mature. That maturity as well is an important signal for the process of parturition. So basically, this activation phase will, in result, will be preparing the uterus for labor. And also, it will make the cervix um, prepared or ripened so that it will easily uh, dilate in the face. Okay, so uh, the third phase is going to be the simulation phase. Okay, the simulation phase is basically it's a time where these inflammatory mediators are going to be rich uh, or rich to peak level. Okay, so that the contraction, the uterine contraction level will be higher and uh, labor will start on this time. Okay, so basically, successful, we say successful uh, delivery, successful labor uh, will depend on different factors. Okay, uh, and the time of this process of labor during the time of simulation phase, okay. Uh, there has to be certain interactions that could result in successful labor delivery. These three important things are the power, uh, or the power, the passenger, and the passage. Okay, so so whenever we say the power, it means adequate uterine contraction that could possibly result in cervical change. Okay, so power we say adequates for a pregnant woman in labor. At least she need to have three to four, three to five contractions within 10 minutes that could possibly result in uh, within the, the 10 minutes, okay? And the other important thing is a passenger, okay? Because so a passenger is a baby, okay? So in order to be effective, uh, in order to be effective labor that could result in delivery, the presentation has to be very good. The, the lie has to be in a normal way and the position has to be uh, import, uh, importantly in a normal way, okay? And the other is the passage, okay? The passage means, most importantly, the female bony pelvis, okay? So uh, here, the female bony pelvis has to be, uh, there are different female bony pelvises, so there has to, it has to be at least the android type, is a gynecoid type, uh, anthropoid type, and platypedal types are different types of um, bony pelvis, okay? So basically, these three things, these three uh, factors has to be interacted uh, and should result in the normal 
labor and delivery process, okay? And the phase four is called the involution phase, okay? This one is usually uh, the last step after delivery, where the uterus will start to involute to its normal level, okay? And the cervix that's going that is uh, highly destroyed during the process of uh, delivery and labor is going to get repaired, and the breast uh, feeding process will start, okay? So, uh, this is called the part four of the involutionary phase, okay? So, as you can see in this uh, curve, there are di uh, there are different uh, hormones and, uh, that are involved during each phase of phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four, okay? So, you'll have this slide and uh, possibly you'll see uh, which uh, hormones are uh, acting on the phase one of parturition, phase two, phase three, and phase four, okay? Okay, very good. Uh, so, the other is a mechanism of labor, okay? Mechanism of labor, uh, normally, as I have tried to explain earlier, the mechanism of labor, uh, there are different um, stage or processes that a baby has to go in order to get delivered. It's not going to be the same as the other mammals or other animals. As I have tried to say, the other animals, usually the their birth canal is somehow straight so that the babies shouldn't get twisted or curved or flexed or extended in order to get delivered. But in case of um, animals, in case of humans, the birth canal not as such favorable so that uh, the baby is going to go easily, okay? So, in order to go, in order to go and in order to deliver, uh, the baby has to go certain steps. These are called the engagement phase, the descent, the flexion, the internal rotation, the extension, and uh, finally, the external rotation and expulsion, okay? So, as you can see here, uh, on the first one, the baby is on the way to engagement, okay? Engagement means uh, attaching to the maternal bony, bony pelvis, which is the inlet, okay? It's called engagement. Normally, the baby uh, will engage either in the lateral, right lateral uh, occipital lateral position or in the left occipital lateral position, okay? So, uh, that's the way how it enters to the maternal pelvis. Basically, the the head has to be in the piparital diameter. That's the only diameter that could be possibly able to enter into the maternal pelvic inlet. Okay, so once the baby uh, enter into the maternal uh, bony pelvis, okay, it has undergone some kind of descent, as you can see on the second one. Okay, as as enter into the maternal pelvis, has it has, it will undergo some kind of descent. Okay, then finally after it enters. Uh, in descent, it will meet the mid pelvis. Okay, in the mid pelvis, what we have is uh, the baby cannot pass as it enters the inlet. Okay, inlet to the bow, mid pelvis will pass more So it has to undergo some kind of change in the uh, morphology. Okay, so basically engage our goal and then descend all mid pelvis will Okay. Rasun shape, shape, somehow it has to modify Maragal levels. Okay, so basically what's going to happen is it, it will flex Yaragal. Flex Yarag, the diameter is going to be sub occipital pragmatic diameter. So it is the smallest diameter that could possibly pass to the mid pelvis. Okay, so mid pelvis is going to be in the right lateral. Uh, occipital transverse position or in the left lateral occipital transverse position in a flexed manner. So basically, flexed mid pelvis and then mid pelvis it will also descend. And these cardinal movements of labor, even though we say engagement, descent, flexion, internal rotation, uh, extension, binilum. These processes are not such uh, separate entity happen in matter quarter room. They are in continuity allu process of chinacho. So let's see, and they engage karagwal, descend karagwal, flex karagwal, and then it again go descend in oral, and then internal rotate karagwal. Zika and the it it undergoes some kind of internal rotation. Okay, so basically the baby will face the maternal back. Okay, so now. After passing the mid pelvis, after passing the mid pelvis, this baby uh, will face the maternal perineum. Okay, as you can see here, 
the maternal perineum the levator ani muscles all will exert some kind of pressure over this uh, internally rotated flexed head okay so in order for this baby he lich lemotat okay lemotat min monalibet malatno it has to undergo some kind of extension okay it has to undergo some kind of extension it has to bypass the resistance of the perineum okay so resistance of perineum pass yarek it will extend yaregal malatno so lik indagababu lik indagababu ziga bejemere lay pelvic inletu lay indegebaw okay አወጣጡ ምን ይሆነው ሮቴት አርጎ ኦኬ ሮቴት አርጎ ማለት ዊ ኮል ኢት ኤክስተርናል ሮቴሽን ኦኬ ኦር ሬስቲትዩሽን ማለት ስለዚህ ሮቴት አርጎ ኤክስተርናል ሮቴት አርጎ ይወጣል ማለት ነው ሶ ቤዚካሊ ኤክስተርናሊ ሮቴት አርጎ ከወጣ በኋላ ዘይን ዳን ቴሪየር ሾልደር ዊል ቢ ዴሊቨርድ ኤንድ ፋይናሊ ዘ ኤክስተርናል ሾልደር ዊል ቢ ዴሊቨርድ ኦኬ ሶ ዚስ ኢዝ ዘ ቤዚካሊ the cardinal movements of labor menelachao enenin no malatno okay uh, i hope this is uh, clear uh, so the next step will be understanding the stage of labor okay basically uh, the stage of labor that can be uh, they can be divided as first stage of labor second stage of labor and third stage of labor so we say first stage of labor menelao it's from the onset of labor okay we'll discuss what onset of labor malet onset of labor it has some controversies allow according to definition due, due due to different textbooks they may have different type of definition or actual but starting from the real onset of labor until the uh, full cervical dentition we consider it to be the first stage of labor okay first stage of labor in allow and Uh, second stage of labor is going to be considered from full cervical dilatation okay up to uh, delivery of the baby that's going to be uh, second stage of labor third stage of labor will be uh, defined as from delivery of the baby up to end of delivery of the placenta that's considered to be third stage of labor okay so uh, then basically the first stage of labor is going to be further classified as latent and active we say latent from the onset of labor up to accelerated rate of cervical dilatation uh, we'll try to de- i'll try to explain what does it mean by accelerated rate of cervical dilatation okay and uh, active phase of uh, labor is going to be from uh, this uh, it's a, it's the phase where there is greatest rate of cervical dilatation okay we will see in detail what does this means okay so basically on the first stage of labor we consider to be uh, onset of labor okay uh, as i have tried to explain earlier when we say labor it has to be a regular painful uterine contraction okay so whenever we say regular uh, painful uterine contraction the pain is usually in the lower abdomen and back okay we call it a true labor okay so in order to say true labor that labor has to effect have to effect uh, some change in the cervical dilatation either effacement or dilatation proper or not effacement la dilatation in order to go back okay and the most important thing is uh whenever we need to have proper uh, time frame for uh, onset of labor up to when we say latent the latent has to be uh within a specific pe- period of time and also the active has to be within a specific period of time <clears throat> and the other thing is whenever we say first stage of labor as we have tried to explain we say latent phase and active phase usually the latent phase is considered to be a quite a uh, period where there is a slower uh, time of cervical change okay latent phase la yallo cervical change is not as such fatta nadallam weyim demo active phase la indallo rate band net bamist weyim demo band net 2 cm per hour yemihed aidallam latent phase la yallo okay so basically it takes time the woman may take time during her latent uh, phase okay latent phase of first stage of labor so whenever we say active first stage of labor okay uh, the rate of cervical dilatation is going to be very fast which means 
or maltese, the rate is going to be 1.5 cm per hour. Okay, so we expect our rust and net one cm cervix to dilate aragalven, assume aragalven in case of active first stage of labor. Okay, and for previous, at least 1.2 cm per hour dilate aragalven. So, uh, basically, uh, active in now latent first stage, milayo. Uh, 4 cm sled of such when 5 cm sled of such sihon basically rate of cervical dilatation will active immune but fat on immune but right in the rate of 1.5 cm per hour or 1.2 cm per hour yeah meter sub time no yeah no it's a cutoff point to say latent and active first stage of labor in most of the time we'll see the figures in 50 percent of the women uh, the interactive first stage of labor at a time of 4 cm cervical dilatation, in around 70% at 5 cm dilatation, and in around more than 89% uh, around 6 cm and 7 cm is going to be the cutoff point to say active first stage of labor. Okay, so this guy is called a Friedman, he's the most important guy in the concept of uh, labor process and partition in understanding the progress of labor. Okay, uh, he's a physician, he's an obstetrician, and uh, he developed the labor progress gap, actually the one that we use currently as a partograph, and uh, also uh, labor follow-up shift are all based on his uh, progress of uh, work. Okay, he's a, uh, he developed this process, his, this uh, concept of uh, understanding labor progress, on his wife while she was in labor. Okay, he was successively uh, jotting down the cervical dilatation, the descent, and the rates of cervical dilatation uh, at the time of her uh, labor. And finally, afterwards, he under he just uh, jot down and connect all the jot jot down pointers, and he found the curve. Okay, so he calculated the rate of uh, cervical dilatation while she was in the latent first stage of labor and the active first stage of labor okay and by his argument by his argument he just uh, developed a labor division curve okay so these labor division curves are called the preparatory division the dilatation division the pelvic division okay you can understand it from this uh, curve okay this is called a Feynman curve and from this Feynman's curve as you can see, uh, there are three divisions, the preparatory division, the dilatation division, and the pelvic division, okay? So here the preparatory division contains uh, two, two parts, which are, div the, which are separated by a uh, broken line, okay? So this green area is called the latent uh, phase, where the cervical dilatation is somehow slower, okay? And then you will have some kind of acceleration phase of cervical dilatation here, okay? Uh, still in the preparatory division. Then you will have a division called a dilatation phase where the cervical dilatation is going to take a maximum slope, okay? As you can see the red line, there is a maximum slope of uh, cervical dilatation, okay? And then when she, when she enter into the pelvic division, there will be deceleration and finally, this uh, orange area will be a second stage of labor, okay? So basically, when you've broken down this curves, you'll have this latent phase, okay? Which is more of more of a horizontal straight uh, with a slow progress of uh, cervical dilatation. And you'll have this yellow area where there is active phase, okay? There is acceleration phase on the active phase and a phase of maximum slope where the cervical uh, dilatation going to be maximum, okay, and then finally uh, the deceleration phase, and finally the second phase. So uh, this is the so-called uh, Friedman's uh, curve, okay. So according to his uh, curve, he said prolonged latent phase, which is a green line, okay, when the, in, in premise, if she exceeds in latent phase for more than 20 hours, and uh, for Maltese, if she is more than 14 hours in latent phase, it's considered to be prolonged latent first flavor. Okay, in the active phase, as I have tried to explain it earlier, okay, he considered 80% of the women will um, uh, enter into active first stage of flavor 
at four centimeter or greater than the irritation. So uh, he considered the cutoff point of latent inductive at four centimeter dilatation. Okay, that's why uh, for so long we were considering active four centimeter in the above. Okay, and he concluded that in the active first stage of labor, the cervical dilatation per hour is going to be 1.5 centimeter uh, per hour for Maltese and 1.2 centimeter per hour for Primis. Okay, that was uh, his uh, argument. Okay, and one thing that I have tried to explain earlier is around 50% of the women will enter into active first stage of labor as 4 cm dilatation. This is very important, okay? And around 74% will enter at 5 cm and 89% enter at 6 cm. Currently, uh, currently our, our guideline considered active first stage of labor to be at 5 cm of dilatation. It was not as we considered it previously at 4 cm. Um, currently, active Gabbaccio Minello, 5 cm line, okay? Uh, so, basically, the, the logic behind that you need to understand is uh, we just consider latent and active in Minello, it's based on the rate of cervical dilatation, okay? At least 1.5 now, 1.2 cm per hour, dilate more than per time, it's uh, quite different for different women, uh, but uh, around 50% as 4 cm light, yeah, and then rate at 10 year adult, okay? And around 74% at 5 cm and 89% at 6 cm light at 10 year adult. So that's the uh, logic behind of classifying latent and active first stage of labor, okay? And still, uh, the WHO uh, recommendation on intrapartum care for positive childbirth uh, experience. Uh, Recommend matter go latent phase and five centimeter line, okay, five centimeter. But we need to take into account that the woman needs to have painful contraction, and uh, in case of latent, uh, variable change in the cervix, uh, some effacement and slower degree of dilatation. I mean, or latent line, okay. But whenever she enter into active phase, the, the 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 contraction is going to be very regular and painful, okay and there will be substantial degree of effacement and dilatation, okay? So these are the recommendations by the WHO as well. Okay, so uh, the other thing is the second stage of labor, okay? So second stage of labor, as we have tried to exp uh, define it earlier, uh, second stage is considered to be with a full cervical dilatation, okay, full cervical dilatation. Uh, so here, uh, the, the thing that we need to consider is the duration of second stage of labor, okay? According to the American College of Obstetric Gynecologists and Society of Maternal and Fetal Medicine and so on, they recommend at least the duration of second stage in premis to be at least three to four hours, okay? And at least two to three hours for Maltese, regardless, regarding uh, to the status of the baby, okay? Uh, status of the baby has to be reassuring, okay? In order to wait this much hours in the second stage of labor. Still, uh, the WH also recommend the same thing, okay? At least for premis, three hours is going to be considered uh, the time for second stage of labor. And bef among, um, beyond that hour, it's going to be considered to be second stage of labor marathon. And, and uh, the other uh, formalities, two hours is going to be considered as the uh, prolonged uh, second stage of labor, okay? Okay, so uh, these are lists of conditions that could possibly cause a prolonged second stage of labor, okay? Like chorionitis, infection of the chorion amnion, okay? Induced labor that are primed and augmented or induced, okay? Uh, maternal age, uh, occipital posterior position, malpositioning, okay? inappropriate type of pushing and uh, ethnicity, non-black ethnicity, and the usage of epidural anesthesia as a labor pain management, okay? This also could result in second stage prolongation, okay? Very good. So the other uh, is the third stage of labor management. Uh, as we have tried to, to define third stage of labor previously, okay? Uh, third stage means from delivery of the BB up to delivery of the placenta, okay? So this uh, is going to, 
ይሄ ሰፍ ስቴጅ ምንለው ኢፌክትድ የሚሆነው ምን ሲሆን ነው ልጁ ከወጣ በኋላ ኦኬ ዘ ዩትረስ ዊል ስታርት ቱ ኮንትራክት ኦኬ ዩትረስ ኮንትራክት በመታደርግበት ጊዜ ፕላሴንታው ፎልድ ማድረግ ይጀምራል በራሱ ኦኬ ፎልድ በሚያደርግበት ጊዜ ፕላሴንታው there will be detachment some kind of space must be fed and general between the uterus and between the placenta okay so this uh, is a sign of separation no matter no so basically as you can see on the figure there are two ways of placenta separation ka center line fold le yarig ichilan demitayot it's called the schulz method and it could separate starting from the periphery okay it's called the dukan method and walan okay so there are two ways of separation of the placenta malet no okay and usually uh, the placenta is expected to deliver within 5 to 10 minutes with average of 6 minutes okay with average of 6 minutes we expect the placenta to deliver by itself okay and if 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 the placenta does not deliver within 30 minutes of time we consider it to be retained placenta blend assume other chalen malet no okay so basically it needs intervention we need to take out that placenta by any means okay so Uh, otherwise otherwise the risk of pph and other complications uh, maternal related complications are higher okay <coughs> so uh the other is uh, management of uh, normal level okay the management of level so we have seen the stages of level the first stage of level specifically the latent and active first stage of level and we try to see what second stage of level means we try to see uh when do we consider prolonged second stage of labor and what are the possible causes of second stage of labor and we also try to see what third stage of labor means okay and how third stage of labor result in effect of the placenta okay and also we try to see the timing of delivery of the placenta and when should we be alerted if the placenta is uh, not delivered within 30 minutes okay so uh now we will try to see what management of the normal means which means uh, if a pregnant woman in labor came to our facility what are the possible things that we uh, need to undertake okay what are the possible approaches that we should uh, undergo in order to manage that woman okay so the first thing is admission criteria okay so based on our guideline based on our guideline and even international guidelines in societies uh, the admission criteria for uh, uh, a laboring mother is considered to be 4 cm and above okay still even if uh, our cut off point is 5 cm still we are using still the guideline is considering 4 cm and above Uh, to be the cut off point for admission of uh, pregnant mother in labor okay and uh, the other thing is uh, a pregnant mother in latent first stage of labor shouldn't be admitted to the hospital unless otherwise she is having some certain types of complications okay for example if she is preeclamptic if she is diabetic if she is uh, came with rupture of membrane okay and other complications okay bleeding and so on okay it's the time that we need to admit to the her to the labor ward regardless of the cervical status okay so these are the two important admission criteria uh, that we need to consider for a pe- for a pregnant woman who came with a uh, uh, labor so uh whenever this woman came to our labor ward okay we always has to uh be warmly friendly to her okay we have to reassure her uh, we have to check her vital signs we have to check her ams records her follow up records we have to take appropriate history physical examination okay and if laboratories are not done on her ams follow up at least we have to revise our ams and if there is any missing uh laboratories so we have to send again a web check we have to thoroughly check her sero status level okay viral markers very important because there are certain conditions that could transmit to the baby as well okay and also we have to change her clothes uh, comfortable clothes okay and we have to reassure the the the, the family her, pa- her partner herself as well okay and uh, also if she was advised or counseled on contraception during her antenatal care okay we have to revise that chart okay if she's in latent still there is a possibility that we can counsel on family planning but if she's already in the active first stage of labor okay 
uh, it's not recommended to counsel uh, on family planning during that time, okay? Because the pain can say anything, okay? Definitely. So always we have to counsel during the antenatal care and uh, during the latent first stage of labor, okay? Not in the active first stage of labor, okay? So the other thing is the vital signs, okay? So whenever the woman came on her with labor, okay, after we admit her to the labor ward, okay, and the first stage of labor, we have to follow the vital signs, okay? So basically the BP, the pulse rate, the respiratory rate, and the temperature has to be followed every four hours, okay? But if the woman has some kind of risks like uh, prolonged rupture of membrane and so on, she is at risk for cholamnitis and infections. Right? So basically, we have to stress on the temperature and we have to follow it every one hour. Okay, so this is for uh, maternal vital sign. The other important thing that we need to consider is the positioning. Okay, so whenever uh, we talk about position, uh, the, the 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 woman the pregnant woman can be at any position that she like okay previously it was uh, advocated the woman to be in the left lateral position okay so that the baby will not going to be uh, in distress and so on but currently uh, she can be in both right and left lateral decubitus position she, she can be in upright position if she is a low risk patient okay she can be walking if she is a low risk patient okay so basically these things will shorten the duration of labor okay they will 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 actually decrease the rate of cesarean section and so on okay so basically uh, currently what's advocated is the woman can be in the lateral positions both in the right left lateral decubitus positions she can be in uh, walking position upright positions okay except the lying supine position okay that is due to the compression of this gravity uterus over the inferior vena cava which possibly result in decrement in the uh, venous return the afterload and preload the preload and the afternoon, which actually result in decrement in the placental perfusion and distress to the baby. So we don't advocate the woman uh, to lie on the supine position, okay? So otherwise, she can be at any position she like, okay? Uh, good. So the other most important thing that we need to consider is the uh, issue of oral intake, okay? The issue of oral intake. Here, uh, if she's in the latent first stage of labor, uh, still the societies and guidelines recommend to take anything like solid foods as well as liquid foods, okay? She's in the latent first stage. But once she enter into the active first stage of labor, uh, it is recommended for her to be in the liquid diet, okay? Which means uh, usually what's going to happen is the gastric emptying time is going to be markedly prolonged, okay? So uh, especially, uh, if she's taking these uh, solid foods and so on, uh, she might uh, end up in uh, vomiting, okay? So as much as possible, uh, we have to refrain from solid food while she's in the, in the active uh, first stage of labor, okay? But still, there are some studies currently uh, which are against this uh, oral intake, uh, only liquid intake the active, uh, during the active phase, especially if the woman is in pedival anesthesia, okay, uh, it is, uh, it is, all, it is uh, advocated that she can take both solid and liquid uh, foods uh, if she is only in epidural anesthesia, okay. These are currently, uh, there is no such a hard and fast rule or there is a restriction of this uh, solid and liquid uh, diets uh, during the active phase if she's in the epidural anesthesia. Okay. The other is the issue of IV fluid. Okay. So basically, the issue uh, uh, the, the issue of IV fluid or securing IV line for a pregnant woman in labor is not advocated. Okay. Unless otherwise the woman is uh, having an indication. Okay. IV line laboring woman if she is only indicated. Yeah, indicated not malet. For example, she is exhausted in dehydration, or if there is any fatal distress that could possibly need resuscitation. Okay. If there is a need of uh, administration of medications and so on, okay, then it's possible that we can secure IV line, we can hydrate her and so on. Okay. Uh, otherwise, as long as she is taking uh, fluid diets, okay, 
there is no such a need to secure IV line. IV lines usually may restrict them for, from ambulation. Okay, uh, it is a source for infections or a source for phlebitis and so on. Okay, so as much as possible, uh, we don't need to secure IV line unless otherwise it is indicated for uh, a laboratory matter. Okay, the other most important uh, thing that we need to, to consider is the issue of companionship during labor and delivery, actually. Uh, yeah, I don't know from where, but uh, in, our, in our country, it's not as such a very, uh, I don't know, a very important topic that is discussed in our uh, labor world. Right? Most of the laboring women are not accompanied, as we have seen. Okay, but companionship is very important uh, part of labor management. In the Western, there are the so-called daulas. These are basically uh, trained professionals, actually, which actually provide continuous uh, kind of physical, emotional, and informational support um, for the pregnant woman, uh, both before, during, and after even delivery. Okay, so uh, this. Uh, Dollars and even uh, partner as well as family members uh, being present for the pregnant woman in labor has a significant benefit. For example, uh, studies show uh, there are different trials done and most of them show that there is significant reduction in the usage of analgesia and the usage of this oxytocin. Uh, the, 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 the mode of deliveries even, the, the risk of operative vaginal deliveries are decreased and the rate of cesarean sections are also increased. Even personal satisfaction, both for the client as well as both for the partner in family, the personal satisfaction is very high when the pregnant mother is accompanied. So uh, basically it is something that should be advocated, okay? Uh, in our society as well. Okay. Uh, the other thing is uh, the pain management. Okay. So pain management. Uh, we do have different types of pain management. There are non-pharmacologic methods and pharmacologic methods of pain management. Um, basically, uh, the the non-pharmacologic methods are those that actually uh, reduce pain by just relieving anxiety or suffering, okay? Uh, the pharmacological methods, they relieve pain, but not exactly they don't, uh, they relieve anxiety and suffering, okay? The anxiety is there, the suffering is there, but somehow they decrease pain, okay? But in case of non-pharmacologic, the anxiety, the suffering, everything is going to be reduced, okay? So water immersion techniques, uh, relaxation techniques, acupuncture, massaging, audio visuals, audio analgesias, everything are non pharmacologic methods that possibly uh, decrease uh, pain by relieving anxiety and suffering. Okay, but considering the pharmacological uh, methods, the most important and most currently, most in the Western, most widely used is epidural anesthesia. Okay, it's epidural anesthesia is type of regional anesthesia actually, uh, and the woman is going to be accept that anesthesia while she is in the active first stage of labor. Okay, so uh, basically, uh, it has its own uh, side effects, which actually we are not going to discuss it here, but uh, it has uh, significant. Uh, pain relief during labor. As we all know, pain uh, or labor pain is a most uh, widely known type of pain as compared to other types of pains. Okay, so uh, epidural anesthesia is a first choice of uh, anesthesia for a laboring mother. Okay, and also we do have other types of pharmacologic methods like the para uh, parental opioids. Okay, basically the fentanyl, the Petidine, morphine, and so on. Okay, but whenever we uh, we administer these uh, parental opioids, always we have to communicate the family. Okay, because usage of these uh, parental opioids usually result in some kind of maternal drowsiness, nausea, and vomiting. Okay, and basically effect on the neonate as well. It could cause respiratory uh, depression. Okay, so always whenever we administer this medication, we have to uh, early communicate the possible side effects to the family. Okay, good. 
Okay, the other thing is fatal condition. So we have seen maternal conditions about pain management, positioning, uh, companionship, and so on and so on things. Okay, now can now we are going to see uh, how we manage the fatal well-being during uh, labor. Okay, so fatal heart rate has to be heard during the first stage of labor every 30 minutes if she's a low-risk patient and around every 15 minutes for uh, high risk patients okay if we are using this, this continuous electronic monitoring okay ctgs um, we can uh, trace every 30 minutes during the first stage and every 15 minutes during the second stage okay we don't advocate using the ctgs or continuous electronic monitoring for a routine purpose of follow-up of pregnant mother okay the reason is the likelihood of diagnosing abnormalities and the likelihood of uh, going for intervention like cesarean section and so on is very high while the woman is continuously being followed. Okay, So basically, we advocate the usage of intermittent auscultation, either using a Doppler or a pinar stethoscope. Okay? So uh, that's what we should practice if the if it is a non-risk uh, Woman in pain labor. Okay. Okay. So the other is the issue of digital vaginal examination. Okay. So per vaginal examination has to be done every four hours. Okay. Uh, while the woman in the first stage and uh, active first stage of in the first stage of labor. Okay. Especially in the active first stage of labor. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we should be. Uh, strict enough to do every four hours because there are certain conditions that we can do even within one hour, even with 30 minutes and so on, okay? So, for example, if the woman is on uh, the digital invasion exam has to be done when the woman is during time of admission, okay? Every four hours has to be done during the first stage while she's refusing, uh, re uh, re uh, receiving any analgesia or anesthesia, we have to check, okay? And if she has a urge to push, this is a sign of second stage of labor, right? So we have to check whether the baby is come, coming or descending down, okay? And we have to check uh, if the baby has some kind of fatal heart rate abnormalities, okay? Uh, if it is tachycardic or bradycardic, we need to check for any cause. If there is membrane rupture, sudden types of membrane rupture during labor, we have to check because there is a possibility of uh, cord prolapse and there's other abnormalities, okay? So, under these conditions, it is indicated to do this uh, digital vaginal examination, okay? So, the other most important thing that we need to consider is the issue of amniotomy or artificial rupture of membrane, okay? Uh, artificial rupture of membrane is not indicated, okay, uh, to shorten the duration of labor, okay? Themselves, latent like cartilage, three centimeter cartilage, it is not indicated to do ARM unless otherwise we have indication. For example, if there is a fetal rate abnormalities, okay, if she is post term and so on, okay, it is possible that we can detect something from the amniotic fluid. Themselves, meconium stained on neutral, bloody leonichlal, anything, okay. So basically, that is an indication to do amniotomy. Otherwise, in order to hasten or wrap, uh, increase the progress of uh, labor, we don't need to do amniotomy. Studies show that amniotomy has never uh, shortened the progress of labor, nor uh, decreased the rate of easier section. Okay, so basically, amniotomy has no uh, such uh, effect on the duration of spontaneous labor. Okay, so we don't need to do amniotomy as we like. Okay, even for those women who are on induction, unless otherwise indicated, we don't need. It's not advocated, and we don't need to do uh, ARM. Okay. Okay. The other is the issue of positioning during the second stage of labor. So let's see. Uh, we have seen the positioning while the woman in the first stage of labor, right? She can be at any position that she like. Okay, except the uh, supine position. So still in the second stage, okay, unless otherwise she is on imminent delivery, okay, imminent delivery, okay, uh, she can be at any position as well, in a squatting position, uh, in upright position, okay, in left lateral position, in any way, okay. These are all possible positions that she could be 
while she's in the second stage of labor, okay? At least she's on imminent type of delivery, okay? In that case, she has to be in the uh, uh, lithotomy position, okay? So otherwise, positioning uh, nowadays, it's not as such a restriction to be in lithotomy position while she is in the second stage of uh, labor. Rather, being in the upright position, being in the squatting position also increases uh, uh, the pushing effect, okay? And also it will shorten the second stage of There are studies that show a shortened second stage of labor while the patient is upright position and the uh, squatting position as well, okay? So there is no as such uh, problem being in upright position. But there are some studies, some studies, very few studies, which also say being in the upright position in the second stage has minimal effect on the fatal heart rate abnormality, okay? But it is a uh, small trials, and uh, the majority are not uh, the majority are in favor of uh, all the positions. Okay. Okay. So these are possible positions that she could be while she is in the uh, second stage of uh, labor. Okay. Okay. The other most important uh, part of uh, discussion is the issue of uh, method of pushing. Okay. Uh, we do have two types of method of pushings, okay? The one is called open glottis and the closed glottis. As you can see on this figure, uh, we do have two types, okay? Closed glottis means, basically, she is going to close her mouth and uh, she will start to push. By that, she is going to increase her abdominal pressure and intrathoracic pressure. And it's going to decrease cardiac output, maternal blood flow, and finally, placental perfusion also increased, decreased, sorry. And uh, it will somehow decrease the pushing effort, okay? Somehow decrease the pushing, but it is one of uh, the recommend, the one of recommendation mechanisms uh, of pushing technique, okay? And the other one is uh, open glottis. In open glottis, she has to push with an open mouth, with open mouth, okay? So that there is no increment in that intrathoracic abdominal pressure. There is no pressure over the placenta, okay? So the placental perfusion is somehow somewhat uh, preserved, okay? So there will be increased, uh, there will be placental perfusion here and there, okay? So uh, these are the two types of techniques. Both can be done for a pregnant woman, but as you compare these two types of uh, uh, pushing techniques, the open glottis technique, basically, it will decrease somehow, this one, as you can see, the, uh, this technique, the open glottis technique, is basically helpful for the baby, okay? Helpful the, for the baby, but it has less power as compared to the closed glottis uh, type of pushing, okay? So, uh, she can be on this open glottis pushing with a preserved, with a preserved placental perfusion, but it takes some uh, longer duration for delivery, okay? With this type of closed, with closed type of glottis uh, type of pushing, the pressure is very high, okay? So the duration of delivery is going somehow shorter, okay? But there is somehow a risk for the baby due to this uh, decrement in the placental uh, perfusion, okay? So, uh, in the, for example, in the Western, in the United States, it is advocated, studies advocate the usage of this closed type of um, pushing technique, okay? Okay, uh, as I have tried to give you this, uh, I, will, I will give you this slide and you will uh, see it uh, later on, okay? So, the other is uh, the issue of early pushing and delayed pushing, okay? The issue of early pushing and delayed pushing, basically, uh, uh, the woman needs to push whenever she had the urge to push, okay? Uh, that is a so-called delayed pushing, okay? That's very important type of vision. Otherwise, if she starts pushing earlier before the urge comes, okay, she is usually get exhausted and she will lose her pushing efforts finally, okay? So basically, the risk of uh, having operative vaginal delivery for sex delivery, vacuum delivery will be higher, okay? So, uh, so the advocacy here is to use delay type of pushing, which means to start the pushing process whenever she has the urge to push, okay? Otherwise, 
if she starts to push in earlier than that, okay, she will easily get tired, okay, exhausted, and she will lose her pushing effect sooner, okay, uh, so that the risk of operative vaginal review somehow is going to increase, okay. Okay, so as there is the issue of preventing perineal trauma, okay, so the issue of perineal trauma, uh, normally, uh, for every delivery, we don't need to use the uh, episiotomy, okay? Episiotomy has, even for preemie gravids, okay? Uh, we use episiotomy only if it is indicated, which means, for example, if the woman has a uh, uh, tight perineum, imminent perineal tear is a, uh, imminent perineal tear, tear uh, expected catheter, okay? or if there is any perineal resistance for the fetal head, uh, head or any indication color to channel, we need to use episiotomy, okay? Uh, and then to home, we don't know, most of the premies in our society, in our uh, hospitals, we see them using this uh, episiotomy, which is wrong, actually. So episiotomy has to be given for indicated patients as well, okay? And um, well, the most important thing in order to prevent perineal trauma, is uh, the issue of manual fundal pressure, okay? Fundal pressure is not as such recommended for a pregnant woman in labor, okay? It has a risk of uterine rupture and significant perineal tear, okay? Third degree and fourth degree perineal tears, okay? So uh, just minding these complications, it's better not to use uh, manual fundal pressures during the time of second stage of labor, okay? Uh, rather, uh, there are some ways of preventing perineal trauma. For example, as you can see on the pictures, there is a so-called perineal massaging, which actually can be started being done during the antenatal uh, period as well, antenatal time, okay? It's just loosening the perineal muscle somehow, okay? It's being practiced in the westerners, it's called a perineal massaging, okay? Uh, and the other one is during the imminent time of delivery, we can use the hands-on approach, okay, or guarding of the perineal muscle, okay. Basically, uh, we have to put like a cup or a thumb finger and index finger over the portrait, okay, so that it will prevent at least first degree and second de degree tears, okay. So by that, we uh, can uh, prevent significant perineal tears, okay. And the other one is uh, the so-called retigans maneuver, which actually not being done currently. It's a little bit painful. But what is going to be done is between the cosix and the anus, so one finger is going to be put, or it will push the uh, chin of the baby upward, so that it's going to affect the extension process or the, the cardinal movement, which is the extension. Okay, and one finger will hold the fetal head in the occipital level. Okay and affect the delivery, okay? Um, uh, so by this, uh, we control the process of delivery. It's called the reticence maneuver, okay? But usually what we actually been practicing is a hands-on approach or the guarding of the um, uh, posterior perineum, okay? Okay. Uh, so the other one is the management of third stage of labor, okay? On the third stage of labor, it's about delivery of the placenta, right? So always we have seen how the placenta is being delivered, okay? Uh, so we have to be able to know whether the placenta is being delivered or not, okay? There are signs of placental separation. The cord length will going to be increased. There will be gush of fluid, gush of blood, okay? And significant uh, resistance will be lost. Right? So these are signs of placenta separation, okay? Always we have to be able to uh, identify signs of placental se separation. Basically, there are uh, two, two, two managements of uh, uh, third stage of labor, right? There is active management of third stage of labor and there is passive management, okay? Passive management, basically, we are going to clamp the cord and we are, we are going to uh, put the cord against gravity, uh, towards gravity, okay? So that the placenta and the membrane will deliver spontaneously by itself, okay? With the help of gravity, okay? So without any manipulation of the uterus or without any traction of the cord, okay? So this is what we call it placenta, passive management, passive management, okay? So once uh, this uh, placenta and the cord, everything uh, goes out, 
then we are going to administer the eutrotonic agents. Okay, so this is what passive management means. The other one is the active management of third stage of labor. Basically here, uh, we are going to have three components, the eutrotonic medications like that of the oxytocin, if possible, ergonestrin, the misoprostol, okay? These all are eutrotonic medications that we are going to administer as soon as the baby is delivered, right? And the other one is the controlled umbilical cord traction. Basically, we have to apply our one hand, non dominant hand, over the uterus. We are going to have gentle pushing of the uterus upward, and then we are going to apply gentle traction, uh, pulling of the cord downward, basically. So uh, we are going to prevent uterine inversion, which is one of the complications of PBH, right? So basically, uh, this is called controlled. Uh, traction, control cord traction. And the other one is a uterine massage, okay? Uterine massage. Basically, we have to do this uterine massage every 15 minutes uh, for one hour of delivery, one hour after delivery, okay? Uh, so that we are going to check the tone of the uh, uterus, whether it's contracted or not, okay? Okay, the other one is the issue of delayed, the actually the final one is, uh, the issue of delayed uh, versus imminent uh, cord clamping, okay? So basically, uh, the, we, should, we say early cord clamping if it is less than one minute, okay? And if it is more than three minutes, it's called delayed cord clamping, basically. So uh, there are different societies and there are different recommendations uh, that that uh, say the benefit of uh, immediate cord clamping and uh, the issue of delayed cord clamping, okay? Usually, delayed cord clamping is associated with significant neonatal benefits, specifically if there is preterm infancies, okay? Uh, it will improve transitional circulation, basically. Better establishment of red blood cell volume, and it will decrease the need of blood transfusion, okay? And the issue of neck the issue of intravascular, uh, intraventricular hemorrhage, all are will, going to be uh, reduced if there is a delayed cord clamping, okay? Uh, so basically, uh, this is what uh, has to be done uh, uh, for neonates born, uh, either delayed cord clamping or immediate cord clamping, okay? Uh, these are my references. Uh, thank you all, and uh, if you have any question, I can accept. So, thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Doctor. It was a very clear presentation. So, yeah, we can move on to the question and answer section. So, participants, if you have any questions regarding today's topic, you can write it in the chat box. So, Doctor will be addressing that. Yeah, so there's one question, Doctor. Uh, okay, so uh, I think it's raised by Telahu, right? Yes. Okay, so what's uh, an indication for episiotomy? Okay, so basically uh, the indications for episiotomy, as, well, as I have tried to explain earlier, episiotomy is not going to be administered for every pregnant woman in labor, even if she is even uh, premic rabbit, okay? So the indications are wherever there is a treat for the perineal tear, okay? If we anticipate any perineal tear due to the upcoming uh, presenting part or the head or the bridge or so, something, okay? If there is imminent signs of tears, okay? If there is perineal resistance, which means by the pushing of the presenting parts, okay? If there is a treat, that means we need to give her artificial tear, okay? Otherwise, if that uh, baby came out, definitely it will result in significant type of perineal tear, which is actually uh, damaging the perineum, resulting in third degree and fourth degree perineal tear, okay? So basically, uh, the issue of giving episiotomy is basically depends on the, uh, the, the treats for the perineum, okay? So even sometimes we also give for multis, right? For multigravids even, okay? Sometimes we may need to give uh, episiotomy, okay? If there is a, um, a need, if there is a need for uh, 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 giving episiotomy, okay?
Okay, the other question is uh, issue of uh, delayed core clamping. As I've tried to explain, we have to practice delayed core clamping for those new units who are born at preterm level. Okay, the, is, the reason is uh, during the time of preterm, it will uh, improve transitional separation. It means uh, it will establish the risk first, it will develop their red per cell volume somehow. Okay, with prolonged stay after delivery the need after delivery the need for blood transfusion the incidence of necrotizing intracolitis the, in the incidence of intraventricular hemorrhage and the likes are going to be reduced okay so basically for uh, preterms space card for preterms that is recommended for term babies there is no such uh, reason for delayed core rather if we delay the issue of court clamping there is a risk of polycythemia okay hyperbilirubinemia and others are also there so there is no need of uh, clamping the cord in a delayed manner for term babies the other is what do you say about the drugs administered for labor pain nowadays so nowadays, what we practice in our uh, nationwide is uh, there are institutions that start to administer epidural anesthesia, which is actually an important measure of pain control, which we actually, if uh, resources are available, that's a recommended type of labor pain, in fact. Um, but always, what I really want to emphasize is here, only we don't need to consider always a pharmacological aspect of labor pain management, okay? The non-pharmacological aspects of labor, specifically the companionship uh, and others are also a significant impact. There are multiple trials, multiple studies, which are advocating the non-pharmacological aspect of uh, labor pain management, okay? Uh, otherwise, uh, we are not practicing you giving trans uh, parenteral opioids. We are less otherwise indicated. Uh, we don't give morphine. We don't give uh, uh, petidine and so on. So basically, uh, if there is epidural anesthesia, that's uh, best management of labor pain. Specifically, it will decrease even nowadays. It is uh, fashion like to do cesarean section here and there due to fear of labor pain. So. Uh, if available resources are uh, not limiting, epidural anesthesia is the best way of addressing labor pain management. So the other ones, what's the average uh, digital vaginal examination recommended by WHO? Uh, so basically, <clears throat> during the first stage of labor, okay, once we diagnosed the latent first stage, which means once uh, once she, it is a true labor, okay, and we diagnosed uh, latent first stage of labor, the recommendation, both standard-wise and both with societies, ACOG and so on, recommend uh, the uh, vaginal examination every four hours, every four hours. But as I have tried to say earlier, this examination is not a, such a restrictive one because if she has anything, for example, if she develop vaginal bleeding, if she suddenly develop rupture of membrane, if there is any fatal fate abnormality, and so on, if she is an urge to push like signs of second stage, everything, okay, there is immediate need to evaluate her with digital vaginal examination. So basically, we cannot say or we cannot set uh, a number of digital vaginal examination for a laboring mother. Uh, the other one is how do we manage precipitous labor? So basically, uh, precipitous labor, first uh, first thing that we should be able to know is uh, we have to be uh, anticipate the labor type, okay? For example, if we have a woman who have delivered within three hours, within two hours of labor previously, if she has this kind of history and so on, okay? Uh, we have to be prepared. Uh, the term precipitous labor is, has no specific management. Rather, we have to anticipate complications of precipitous labor, which is like, for example, perineal tear, uterine atony, PPH, and so on. So we have to antip anticipate these complications and we have to be prepared for that. That's the management for precipitous labor. Rather, there is nothing that we could do by precipitous labor. It will continue, okay? Uh, or we don't give tocolytics 
to arrest the labor process. But one thing that we should do is we have to anticipate possible complications of PPH, uh, perineal laceration, and so on. So, after, so that we should be prepared for those things. Okay. Okay, so basically, uh, the other question is how can healthcare providers support women's physical, emotional need during labor for favorable outcome? That's a very good question. Uh, so, as we have seen, most of our patients, most of our pregnant mothers, they don't have a knowledge, okay? Uh, knowing the types, knowing the process of labor, knowing the types of labor pains, okay? and knowing the mechanisms of uh, handling those pains uh, is uh, if it is addressed by the healthcare provider okay early during the time of antenatal care okay uh, during the time of labor if we give her proper informations how to labor how to breathe how to push how to do anything okay she is going to manage it okay the thing is most of the time, they are not pre-informed. Most of our pregnant mothers, they are not pre-informed during the time of antenatal care, during even the time of labor. Okay, they don't have, they don't know how to push, they don't know how to breathe, um, they don't know how to position themselves uh, or something. Even we are not advocating them to have companions and so on and so on things, which are important things that possibly uh, decrease the uh, labor pain. Okay, so basically. If we do those things, okay, uh, the woman will understand the whole process and the outcome will depend on her emotional status, basically, okay? So if she's confident enough to handle those labor pain, the, if she uh, possibly understand uh, how to push, how to breathe, how to position herself, okay, basically she's helping us and possibly she's helping her baby, okay? So the final outcome is, is going to be depend on those things. So it's our responsibility, it's our uh, role to give this uh, as a healthcare provider to give proper educational levels and physically, as we have tried to explain earlier, physically, emotionally, we have to support her, that's going to pass and everything, emotional support, we have to give. Okay, the other one is why it's not recommended to put on CTG continuously. Okay, so basically CTG is recommended for certain type of patients. Okay, uh, the reason behind this CTG is following continuously. Okay, so there are certain minor uh, artifacts that could appear on CTG monitor. There are certain abnormalities that could appear on CTG monitor that actually could be normalized within a certain period of time, okay? So, if you have CTG, if you found those certain minor abnormalities, it means that we are going to uh, intervene that labor process. We may need, we may uh, go for caesarean section or unnecessary intervention. So, basically for non-risk patients, who are uh, who are whose labor started spontaneously without any risk, without any complication? Okay, it's it is better for the nature to take care of the pregnancy. Okay, the labor process. What we should do is at least we have to follow the fetal heart beats every thirty minutes in the first stage for the risk and for high risks every fifty minutes. Okay. So the reason behind this, even this is a recommendation by the WHO, okay? The reason behind this, it will increase our intervention, okay? It will increase uh, our caesarean section rates, okay? It will increase our operative delivery rates. So that's the reason behind uh, uh, not using CTG monitoring for every uh, pregnant woman who are not uh, risky, okay? And uh, in fact, CTG monitors are not as such uh, widely available here and there. For example, in our, in our hospital, in the OD2, we, we, we do have three or four CTGs, okay? It's not going to be addressed for every pregnant woman, okay? And resource-wise, it's very limited, okay? And the other is interventional-wise, we may go for caesarean section here and there, okay? Due to some minor artifacts, minor abnormalities that could possibly uh, correct it by themselves. 
The other one is how is the practical utilization of companionship. Uh, yeah, I have tried to explain it earlier, okay? Uh, it's not as such widely used in our country. At least a partner or at least a female uh, family member has to accompany a pregnant woman, okay, while she's in labor, even in the delivery room, okay, even in the imminent delivery room, okay, uh, a partner has to be there helping the, uh, the, the, the pregnant woman, okay. That, as I have tried to explain earlier, has significant effect, okay, significant effect on decreasing the operative vaginal delivery rate, the risk of cesarean section, the risk of visage of even analgesias, okay, or poets, and others are also significantly decreased by this companionship. So, practically, we are not to the limits that we need to be, okay, but it has to be practiced. It has to be. This is uh, basically uh, the, pro the problem of uh, knowledge, I think so. Okay, basically, uh, what are the current diagnostic criteria? For arrest disorder, arrest of descent, or failure of descent. Okay, so these uh, arrest disorders are active phase disorders. Okay, so basically, when the cervix uh, reaches to active first stage of labor, which is in our guideline around five centimeter of labor. Okay, five centimeter of cervical dilatation. Okay, if it stays for two hours. Okay, for two hours. Uh, in Maltese and one hour in premise, I mean, two hours in premise and one hour in Maltese, basically we are going to diagnose arrest of cervical dilatation, okay? That we need to assess the cause for that, okay? Basically, the cause for arrest disorders could be maternal uh, effort, maternal problem, okay? Uh, which means a power problem, or it could be due to the passenger, passenger or passage problem. So basically, in order before we intervene, okay, either by augmentation or something, or uh, before doing any cesarean delivery, any intervention, we need to assess the cause for arrest disorders. Okay, so that's how we should proceed. Thank you. That's a final question. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's the final question. So on the, on behalf of Blue Hills Ethiopia and all our participants as well as Leonard, I would love to thank you, Doctor, for taking the time to present such an amazing uh, and marvelous presentation on the 98th Blue Hills Virtual Seminar on a Saturday. So uh, we hope we will be <laughs> seeing more of you in future sessions with uh, related obstetric cases topics as well. So, Doctor, if you have any last remarks that you want to pass to our participants, uh, let me give you the chance one more time. Uh, I think, yeah, I have tried to mention all most of the, uh, the core issues about the presentation. And uh, maybe for participants that I want to uh, emphasize is the issue of companionship, the issue of uh, some labor, man important labor management has to be focused and because these are the things that we should uh, go and tell for the health providers, okay? And even we have to tell the patients their rights and responsibilities that she could be possibly be accompanied by her partner. That's her right, okay? So basically, we need to advise them. We need to give them education during the antenatal periods as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Doc. Oh, 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 oh,